Paul, we know, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So we're going to find him repeating himself, which is fine. There's obviously a number of things in detail that Paul lays out for the believers that he's writing to, the young pastors, the new churches, um, corrections, all kinds of things. But every so often, almost in every one of his letters, maybe not every one, but he will just, in kind of a capsule form, summarize the entire gospel or summarize his total meaning and life and calling, his total purpose. And we have, um, of the number of those, there's one in the first chapter of his first letter to Timothy. And we'll just um, jump into verse 3 after addressing Timothy. He says, as I urged you when you went into Macedonia, remain, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they do not teach other doctrines, or give heed to fables, endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. Now the purpose of this commandment that he was giving to Timothy is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. We'll end a reading there. Paul's point, and we want to read this carefully. Paul said, the purpose, other versions say, the whole aim of my preaching. So his total message, the end aim, the goal of his preaching is that people would have love out of a pure heart, love out of a good conscience, love out of sincere faith. Now, those are not necessarily, they're not three different things. I want you to have a pure heart. I want you to have a good conscience. I want you to have sincere faith. Notice there's really one thing. It's love. It's love that springs from a pure heart. That's the fountainhead. Two, it is channeled by a good conscience. Three, it is sustained and maintained by sincere faith. So the one thing is love. The, God, the love of God in our hearts. Now, there's a couple things we could look at here. Really, first is the experience of sins forgiven and hearts purified by faith in Jesus' blood, in the atonement. Love out of a pure heart. A pure heart clearly implies that in our natural state, our heart is not pure. We know from universal experience and from ample scripture that we come into the world with a heart that is bent toward rebellion against God, toward self-sovereignty, toward rebellion, period, pride, unbelief. That is what then has to be remedied before anything else can be accomplished. So love out of a pure heart is established by being thoroughly converted, sins forgiven, born again, born of the Spirit, adopted into the family of God, justified in the sight of God, made alive. And then that person must go on and be sanctified entirely, purifying their hearts from the inbred, inherited, inborn inclination to sin. A.W. Tozer put it very simply and very well. He said, I must forsake my sins and go on to forsake myself. That's what Paul's talking about. Love out of a pure heart. Then it's love out of a good conscience. There are four or five different kinds of consciences mentioned in Scripture. Evil conscience, weak conscience, um, good conscience, seared conscience. A good conscience is one that is properly instructed to know right from wrong so that we have a defense from the enemy who would accuse us when we don't deserve it 
and who would also whisper, excuse us, <laughs> excusing us when we don't deserve it. We are not fooled by the alternate voices that we hear coming from a, an evil world and a sinister foe, a supernatural foe. A good conscience keeps me balanced to know right from wrong and it uh, protects me from what you could call libertinism where nothing bothers us or from the Bible speaks of a weak conscience. Now a weak conscience is not a conscience that lets you do anything and never bother you. A weak conscience as Paul uses it is a constant a conscience that is always accusing you. In other words, won't allow you to do anything. Um, you're always in trouble. That is just as defeating and can be just as deadly as a conscience that lets you do anything and never signals you. So we need a good conscience, one that is well educated and that signals when it should signal. And we understand it. Third, so there is education, is second, experience is first, education, meaning of my conscience, second, and then edification, that we are upheld by, this love is maintained by a sincere faith. And the word sincere is interesting, it literally means having no wax. It means nothing fake, nothing that when it's put out into the sun, will melt and reveal that there are defects that were just merely pasted in by wax and covered over. We must be able to stand the heat and not melt. Sincere faith then is necessary, which, is, which then keeps love for God buoyant and keeps love for others buoyant and operative and quick. Once we, if, if we've all experienced this, if our faith sags, we get to grousing a little bit about our lives or the way God hasn't answered prayer or whatever, just that we can get sort of a little bit sour in our hearts and a little bit distant from God. If our faith begins to sag a bit, so also does our love for God, our interest in being close to God, our love for the brethren, love for gathering together for worship, our love for God's word, all these things quickly are affected. If our faith sags, it no longer sustains love of God, his word, the truth, God's people, and so forth. All these three channels springing from a pure heart, governed by a good conscience, sustained by a built-up, edified, strengthened faith. That's God's aim for every single one of us. We're wrong if we have any other aim than that. Father in heaven, we have enough to worry about in this life. The only thing we need to focus on is that our hearts are pure, our consciences are good, our faith is sincere and strong. Lord, by your grace, that's possible. And by your grace, may we maintain that. And having done that only, that's all we have to do, Lord. We will hear from you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.